easily as it has forgotten everyone else. So come and introduce our next speaker. Satya Das's mission in life is to make a difference in the world. After a successful first career as an award-winning journalist, author, and leading opinion maker, Satya co-founded Cambridge Strategies with his colleague Ken Chapman. Their business partnership grew out of 20 years of weekly lunches where no-holds-barred arguments were always the top item on the menu. In addition to his consulting work, which is impressive by any standards, Satya's pro bono work focuses on inclusion, diversity, and community building, often viewed through the perspective of human dignity and social cohesion. Satya is a true citizen of the world, fluent in many languages, including both of Canada's official languages. With several shelves full of awards and recognition, Satya counts his life partner, Mita, and their two daughters as his true inspiration. Thank you for cover a lot of things today and bring it back to a Gandhian perspective. I'm going to talk about everything from poetry to economics to petroleum engineering, but I promise you they will all tie together in the end. As our lighting of the lamp signified today, we remember the light that we lost 62 years ago. But the loss of a life, the assassination of a leader, cannot and will not in itself stop the force and the power of ideas. If there was anything Gandhi taught us through his words, through his example, through his actions, it was the power of truth, of truth as a force in life. And that truth, elusive though it is, hidden though it may be in times of violence and turbulence, the truth of universal love of universal compassion, of dignity and respect and acceptance of the other, that truth has not diminished. So, when we think about what is relevant about Gandhiji to our lives and to our situation today, let's begin with where Alberta and where Canada are in the world. As you know, we live in an energy economy that is comprehensively addicted to fossil fuels and hydrocarbons. Very soon, as technology makes more of the oil sands recoverable, Alberta will become the single largest oil reservoir in the world. Think of that. We're number two right now. We are going to become the global oil superpower. And now I want to think about the ramifications of that and the implications of that. We really have two choices. We can continue to develop and exploit this resource strictly on an economic model, or we can take a holistic Gandhian approach and think of our duty of societal development, our obligation of stewardship to the planet, and what role we can fulfill as being a democratic, inclusive, and pluralistic society. This is going to be critically important because when you look at the five major oil reservoirs in the world, we are the only one that does not foster and perpetuate a culture of violence. The other major reservoirs, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Venezuela, and all of these, to a large extent, we have the antithesis of Gandhian feeling. We have not only riches and wealth that's amassed to perpetuate military power or strong control over the populace or a means of stifling human potential and creativity if it challenges the ruling order. In many cases, we actively see oil riches used to promote and perpetuate cultures of violence. How then do we use our singular opportunity to build a culture of peace? What would Gandhi counsel that we do in the privileged position we find ourselves in? One thing I know that would be disheartening, because it's disheartening to all of us, is the almost unbridgeable divide that emerged at the Copenhagen summit on climate change. On one side, you had the rich and developed world 
which had got to its position of privilege and power and wealth by the unlimited exploitation of whatever planetary resources it found, and now is in a position of lecturing less developed countries to stop your growth, stop your development, stop aspiring to our lifestyle, because as you use fossil fuels in the process, you are destroying the future of the planet. No one's going to put up with this hypocrisy, and we know that very well. And nor are we going to get very far by denying the reality that we must adapt to climate change. We can't stop it, we can't prevent it, we will need to adapt. So, to give our sisters and brothers in most of the world even a semblance of the life we have, we will need enormous amounts of energy. If India and China and Indonesia and Brazil are to come up to two-thirds of Canada's standard of living, we are going to need the equivalent of four trillion barrels of oil. That is absolutely an astonishing amount, and if we do that through the consumption of fossil fuels and hydrocarbons, we are not going to have a planet. In fact, when you look at the planetary resources and what we consume, if the entire world were to have the life we have here today, we would need five planets. So what do we do? How do we address it? It's quite clear that the only sustainable answer is one of the development of abundant, renewable, sustainable resources that will enable other countries to have cheap sources of energy that will support their aspirations to simply having a decent life for 